When people think of genetic engineering, two things generally come to mind. The first group is things like fish that grow extremely quickly or plants and animals that have been specially engineered to increase their yield for human consumption. These have obvious uses that are designed to make our lives easier and more sustainable. The second thing that comes to mind is genetically modified humans. While these sorts of mad science experiments aren't typically common, their prevalence in popular culture and the ongoing discussion surrounding the idea of designer babies tends to push them to the forefront of people's minds. Fortunately, many of these dystopian fantasies have been made illegal by the Human Animal Chimera Prohibition Acts of 2016 and 2021. However, there's a lot more that is possible with genetic engineering, from bizarre but useful creations to some experiments that uh, were performed just for the hell of it. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the most unexpected uses of genetic engineering. The development of vaccines was one of the most important advancements of modern medicine, and countless lives have been saved as a result. But, like all things, there is a cost associated with the technology. Without insurance, the required immunizations against diseases like polio, diphtheria, and rubella can cost hundreds of dollars. While efforts have been made to increase vaccine availability, the problem of cost is much worse in developing nations. There's also the issue that nobody really likes needles. So, what if there was a better, cheaper way to deliver vaccines? That was the idea behind edible vaccines grown using bananas. Efforts were made using other produce and even tobacco, but it was decided that bananas were the most effective means of delivery. The process was pretty straightforward. An altered form of the virus would be injected into a banana sapling. As the plant grew, it would continue to replicate the virus's proteins, but it would not contain any infectious part of the virus. This meant that once the banana was consumed, the immune system would develop antibodies to fight the virus protein, similar to a traditional vaccine. It was a brilliant idea, and one that was put forth for experimentation back in 1996. Unfortunately, it quickly became clear that as novel and exciting an idea as it was, it just wasn't going to be viable. The efficacy of the vaccine seemed to change on a person-to-person -person basis, but even if it was 100% effective, the researchers weren't prepared for the logistical concerns of such a project. What would happen if a field of banana vaccines contaminated other plants, such as by pollen being spread? How would regulations be handled regarding the size of a dosage and its proper administration? Could edible vaccines even pass the government regulatory process? And then there's the question of, given how much anti-GMO sentiment there is, would people even be willing to receive their vaccines from bananas instead of from needles? These were all important questions, and they were questions that the researchers were just not prepared to answer. By 2004, the project was largely abandoned. However, it doesn't mean that the story is over for edible vaccines. To date, most of the research performed has been done by botanists rather than immunologists, and there remains significant interest in the clinical development of these vaccines. While most vaccines are manufactured using animals, there has been a rise in plant-based vaccine research in recent years. Perhaps the 20th century botanists were just ahead of their time, and these edible vaccines will soon come to fruition. Technically, the cabbage in question was poisonous, not venomous, but this was the name commonly given to cabbage that was genetically engineered to produce the toxin found in scorpion venom. The purpose of this experiment was to attempt to reduce the amount of pesticides used on crops that could be harmful to humans while still providing protection from very hungry caterpillars. Insects are a primary source of food for scorpions, and thus potent insectotoxins were able to be isolated from the scorpion venom that were expected to be lethal to insects while remaining harmless to humans. The first stage in this research was to spray crops with the scorpion venom, using it as a natural pesticide. This was first tested back in 1994, though the results weren't as promising as researchers had anticipated. To try and increase the efficacy, researchers in 2012 decided to take the next logical step, engineer cabbages to produce the scorpion venom on their own. If this venom uh, was lethal to insects while remaining harmless to humans, it would be an ingenious solution that would save a lot of time and cut down on the use of harmful pesticides. Unfortunately, the results were once again underwhelming. The key issue is the delivery mechanism of the toxin, and the seemingly pedantic comment we opened with is actually the not-so-fatal flaw in the design of these cabbages. Scorpions are venomous, meaning they use their stingers to inject their venom directly into the insects 
and other prey. Because the cabbages were poisonous, the toxins instead had to be ingested. But the scorpion's toxin never naturally evolved to be resistant to the harsh conditions found inside an insect's stomach. As such, while the engineering of a cabbage mixed with scorpion is an interesting piece of scientific ingenuity, it thus far lacks any practical application. That doesn't mean that this is a dead end, though, and scorpion toxins are still a promising lead for the development of future insecticides. We just need to devise a way for them to survive the journey through the insect's digestive system first. That, or we need to create cabbages that actually have venomous stingers, which definitely sounds possible. In 2007, scientists working out of Seoul, South Korea, cloned the first ever genetically modified cats. The cats were modified to produce a red fluorescent protein that would allow them to glow in the dark. To achieve this, the scientists took skin cells from a cat and injected the fluorescent gene in them before transplanting those modified cells into three eggs that were being cloned. Incidentally, the cats being cloned were also the mothers, meaning that they gave birth to their own glow-in-the-dark clones, which is all kinds of weird. But cool, though one of the cats died at birth, the other two survived. While this may seem like some sort of bizarre novelty project, there was a much greater goal in mind here. Developing treatments and cures for genetic diseases. By proving they could recreate this trait in cats, the scientists believe they could use the same method of cloning to produce cats with specific genetic diseases, including those that afflict humans, and use those cats to research treatments. Working out of the Mayo Clinic in 2011, a team of scientists from the United States and Japan decided to take this research a step further. This time, they used the green fluorescent protein found in crystal jellyfish along with a gene from the rhesus macaque. While making random animals glow in the dark might seem a little bit frivolous, it actually serves a very practical purpose. It allows the researchers to tell at a glance whether or not their gene insertion worked. Testing to see if the cats actually contained the gene from the rhesus macaque would require genetic testing, but the presence or absence of a fluorescent green glow indicates whether or not the experiment was successful without the need for complicated testing. Adding bioluminescence is common practice when performing these sorts of genetic modifications. As for the rhesus macaque gene, its purpose was to produce a protein that would block the feline immunodeficiency virus, the virus that causes feline AIDS. Rather promisingly, nearly all of the offspring of these glowing cats contained both the gene that caused them to glow as well as the gene to protect against AIDS. However, while the gene that should offer protection is present, they have yet to confirm a large-scale study to prove whether or not the cats have been made immune to cat aids. But if it's successful, these experiments could have incredible implications for humans. Spider silk is a highly sought after material with innumerable uses. This is a material that's five times stronger than steel and is used in everything from needlessly expensive neckties to bulletproof vests. Over a billion dollars of spider silk is sold every year, and the issue has never been what to do with the material, it's how to get enough of it. Spiders are territorial creatures, so whenever researchers tried to set up spider farms to harvest their silk, the spiders had this nasty habit of killing one another. Obviously, the solution to this problem was goats. Well, it may not have been obvious to the rest of us, but to Randy Lewis and his team out of the University of Wisconsin, it was obvious. Spiders' dragline silk genes were implanted into goats so that the goats would produce the protein in their milk. Although the experiment was successful, only a percentage of the goats manifested the spider silk gene. Of the first seven goats engineered to have this trait, only three wound up testing positive for it. But that was still far more efficient than relying on a bunch of spiders that would rather kill each other than play ball with humanity's selfish desires. Most importantly, nothing else about the goats changed. Their development, behaviors, appearance, and health did not show any difference when compared to other goats. It's possible that their overall milk production may have been altered, but seeing as every goat is different when it comes to how much milk they'll produce, there's really no way to be sure. All we know is that they were making enough to harvest generous quantities of spider silk from it. Spider goats were a big step forward compared to regular spiders, but scientists still felt that they could do better. The next target for spider silk production was alfalfa plants. Plants naturally produce large amounts of proteins anyway, so it was believed that alfalfa could provide an extremely cheap and effective means of producing spider silk. Unfortunately, these tests weren't as promising. Only about 50% of plants modified to produce the silk protein manifested the gene. Of those that did, many treated the gene as a virus and shut down production of the silk on their own. 
It's possible that as few as 10% of the genetically altered plants would actually wind up producing the silk protein. That's highly inefficient, but because the plants are so cheap to produce, it remains an active area of research. So far, every instance of genetic engineering that we've looked at today had a specific goal in mind. It may not always have panned out as intended, but at least they knew what they were aiming for. Our final entry today is a little bit different. The Mouse Evolution Project out of the University of Osaka in Japan had no specific goal in mind. They just wanted to mess with some mice and see what happens. Researchers genetically engineered what they called mutator mice. These mice were altered to be prone to miscopying DNA, thus allowing for greater numbers of mutations. This process was repeated through 20 generations of mice over nine years. By making the mice more prone to mutations, their goal was to expedite the evolutionary process and see what mutations would arise as a result of breeding the mutator mice with one another. With each new generation, the mice were examined one by one for any changes. Researchers were expecting to see physical changes, and the experiment did produce a mouse with short limbs and a tail like a dachshund. But that wasn't what caught the eyes of the researchers. Uh, while checking the mice, they discovered that one of them was chirping like a bird. When that singing mouse bred, its babies too produced the same chirping sounds. By the time they went public with this discovery in 2013, they had bred over 100 singing mice. But they also had discovered something else interesting. When regular mice grew up in proximity to the singing mice, they used different sounds and tones to communicate than other normal mice. It was almost like they were creating their own dialect the way humans have countless times across the world. Researchers around the world have studied various songbirds in an attempt to understand the origins of human language, but the scientists out of Japan hoped that these singing mice and the new dialects they have created could be crucial in understanding how language evolved in humans. While songbirds may be more vocal than ordinary mice, the advantage of studying mice is that they are also mammals and their brains and other biology are much more similar to humans than birds are. The project didn't stop there, and the mutator mice continued to be bred to let the evolutionary process move forward. While there are no specific goals in mind other than to see what evolution would bring to their laboratory next, they do remain hopeful that these mutator mice could be useful in the study of various genetic diseases that plague humanity. But for lead researcher Arakuni Uchimuru, the dream doesn't have to end with something so useful or humanitarian. He said, I know it's a long shot, and people always say it's too absurd, but I'm doing this uh, with hopes of making a Mickey Mouse someday. Perhaps he's already succeeded and is just awaiting Disney's famous mouse to enter public domain before revealing his creation. We can hope.